Hi, y'all, and welcome to tonight's live stream. Buried inside the Delphi murders case against Richard Allen is a ticking time bomb. Evidence, potentially crucial evidence, is missing. It's not just a little evidence, it's a fair amount of it. Is this missing evidence going to blow up the prosecution's case against Richard Allen? That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So happy Monday. I hope you all had a great weekend. I'm curious how many of you saw the eclipse. We had a partial eclipse here. It wasn't a whole one. Uh, but honestly, one of my favorite memories ever is a few years back, the one and only total eclipse I've ever seen in my life was occurred full on about an hour and a half from here. So my son and I got in the car and drove up there. He played hooky from college and I took the day off work and we went up there just to see the eclipse. And it is just such a good memory. We wanted to be away from the city. And so we just walked out into a field and we're like, how about here? And it wasn't, we weren't the only ones who had that idea. A bunch of other people headed out there too. So we're all out in the middle of a field talking about the eclipse. We were there hours early. So everybody got to know everybody else. It was just so amazing and really interesting. I actually have um, a picture I'm going to share with you. This is my son and me when we were at the eclipse. We even have our highly cool eclipse glasses on, as you can see. So it was a few years back. It was such a good memory, just a lot of fun. So anyway, uh, let me know in the comments or the chat if you got to see the eclipse and what you thought about it. I thought it was unbelievable when I got to see that full eclipse. It was so unexpected. It, I mean, even though I read a lot about what was going to happen, it still was truly amazing. So I want to say a special shout out and hi to the first five who made comments in the chat, the turning away, Molly, Michael, Cognac Kobo, and Melody Perkins. Thank you all. And let's get into Richard Allen and the Delphi murders case. It is moving at the speed of light right now. Trial is on the way in May. Jury questionnaires have already gone out. Really significant motions are being filed and decided right now. I'm going back. Yep. Okay, good. Double checking that sound and everything was okay. <laughs> I, I hate it when I have problems with that. So to, tonight I want to talk about the court's ruling on the defense motion to dismiss because of the destruction of evidence. And I want to talk about why I think that issue is so critically important, what I think it's going to mean for the case. So as a quick reminder, Richard Allen is accused of murdering two young girls who were out for an afternoon stroll on a, an unseasonably warm February day in Delphi, Indiana. Richard Allen's defense team says the murders were actually committed by a group of Odinists who practice a heathen religion of Nordic origin and who arranged Nordic rune symbols on the bodies of the two girls. The defense lawyers say Richard Allen has been set up to take the fall and that this Odinist group is so powerful that they even have appointed Odinist guards to watch Richard Allen in prison. I personally, when I first heard that part, I thought, okay, there's zero way that part is true. But then the prosecution actually admitted that the guards were even wearing Odinist patches. <laughs> okay, I guess anything is possible. So let's talk about the defense motion to dismiss. And I want to talk about what's missing and then what's the standard. And then we'll also cover what the judge ruled. And then I'll talk about why I think it's even though the defense lost this motion, I, I, would, I would say spoiler alert, the defense lost this motion, but it's not much of a spoiler. <laughs> the judge ruled for the prosecution, but the, the judge is ruling against the defense on pretty much everything. So I don't think that part will surprise you. But then I'm going to talk about why I still think it's a critically important issue in the case. So even though the defense lost the first round, I think it's going to create a huge problem for the prosecution during the trial and then on appeal. So I'll explain a little bit more about that. Now, we had covered the motion to dismiss itself earlier, but there was a hearing about two weeks ago. It wasn't broadcast, but we are fortunate to have a copy of the transcript now, thanks to Bob and Ali Mata of Defense Diaries, 
to the unraveling and to Kara Wynicki. They paid and it is expensive to have the hearing transcript produced and then they made it public. So hats off and much appreciation to them for doing that. So let's talk about what exactly is missing. And to put this in perspective, this was a huge case in a small town, probably one of the biggest ever in Delphi, Indiana. Two young girls were missing and then their bodies were found. It involved local police, state authorities, the FBI, and of course, law enforcement across those three entities interviewed many people. They don't even know how many people they interviewed. We'll be talking about that. So at the hearing, former Delphi chief of police, Stephen Mullen, who is now an investigator with the prosecutor's office, testified that. Let me add it to the screen and uh, pull it up. And I'm going to go to, let me see what page I want to go to. I'm supposed to keep talking. Uh, 49. Okay. So let me go to 49. It's going to be a little awkward. I need a keyboard down below. Okay. So here's what he testified, Stephen Mullen. He said, and then your, he was asked, and then your discovery would indicate that interviews conducted in that interview room with that DVR were missing from 2014, and they put sick in there, I think they meant from February 14, until February, or maybe not, until February 20th, but not including February 20th. And the girls disappeared on, or were found, I can't remember which, on February 14th. So it was, what they're saying is the first week is missing. So, and he, he says, I think there was still some available to be seen on the 20th question. Okay. There might be some missing, but some are there for the 20th answer. Yes. And I should also add that some of the audio is missing, even for the times where there was actual video visible. So there may be video that's visible, but the audio randomly sometimes is not available to be heard. And the question, okay. And did you or anyone that you know of intentionally leave the recording on so that it would delete interviews? Answer, absolutely not. Question, do you consider this to be either human error or just a spontaneous event with the DVR recording? Answer, that's the only explanation I can provide. I'm going to make this a little bit, it's, it's not going to be super easy to read. Let me also make this document bigger, see if that'll help. So what could go wrong, right? Technology. I personally never have trouble with that, but apparently the chief did. And months later, he discovered that the machine had not been being shut off as it was supposed to be shut off, which meant it kept recording all night, all weekend, even when no one was being interviewed. So he had put this DVR in thinking that this was going to be something that would record all of the interviews. Instead, what happened was it didn't get shut off. It recorded over interviews that had been done. And so that ended up meaning there is a gap in evidence. There is missing evidence, missing recordings. And it's a nightmare of epic proportions for the prosecution because they're missing key evidence. It not only means they're missing things that might help them with the case, but it also means it's an opening for the defense to say, that thing you're missing, it would have helped me. And the defense has fully recognized that. In fact, Richard Allen's team points out that some key interviews from the prime time early on in the case, the most important time, are missing. And they're concerned because they don't have access specifically to interviews of two men, Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall, and to some unknown number of people who came forward to tell the police that they suspected Brad Holder of the murders. And the police... Uh, chief admits that, yes, they there were people who fingered him, said he might be responsible. And it gets even worse be, for the prosecution because Brad Holder's interview is not the only one missing, and the police don't really know what they're missing. Let's take a look at page 58. Okay. Um, was Brad Holder's the only recording that was lost? Heavens no, says the police officer, Stephen Mullen. Okay, and the recordings weren't just for this investigation, were they? Answer, there were other investigations that were probably conducted during that period of time in that same interview room that were destroyed as well. 
that's really important for what I'm going to say later. It wasn't just this case. It was probably other cases as well. Question, and do you have any way of recreating a list of all of the interviews that happened during that time frame? Answer, I do not. Question, and if officers did what was expected, which is write a narrative for the interview that was recorded, then where would that information be contained? Answer, it would be contained within the reports and narratives that the officer memorialized their interviews and either the state re police reports, the FBI reports, or perhaps in the Orion RMS system. Question, or even other agencies, answer, or question beyond those, correct? Answer, yes, other agencies. And that's true. There were other agencies that did memorialize reports that we have turned over. So in other words, these reports went out to the extent that anybody took notes or wrote up what had been said in the interview instead of just relying on the fact that now this DVR had been installed and now there would be the chance to literally have the recording anytime you wanted. To the extent people did not rely on that and wrote notes, they went out. They're in whoever's file. And it's not anywhere written down. There's no log of the people who were actually interviewed. There's no way to know exactly what they're missing or who did those interviews. There's no way to precisely track that information. And that's something obviously of great importance to the defense and something that will be significant to them. And to make matters even more awkward for the chief and the prosecution, they didn't reveal this to the defense right away. Let's take a look at page 61. So, uh, question. So let me get this straight. You knew, this is now cross-examination. You knew, you knew in August of 2017 that Brad Holder's video was missing. It had been taped over, right? Well, let me make, I'll strike that. You knew in August of 2017 that from February, what was it, the 14th up until February 20th of 2017, I mean, literally the first week of the investigation that there, those no longer existed, those videos, right? Answer, yes, that's correct. Question, but then when you provided the defense with discovery in, let's say, I think it was the first time it was in December, you didn't say, hey, by the way, I need to tell you this. There's some missing video of people that were interviewed in the very early stages of this case. You didn't tell me that, did you? You didn't tell Mr. Rosie that, did you? That's the other counsel for, uh, for Richard Allen, the defendant. Answer, I didn't tell you and I didn't tell Mr. Rosie that, but I believe I mentioned it to you or, or agent, his agent. It's from memory, my memory. I didn't write it down. I didn't document it. Question, but it's not, okay, well, did you tell Mr. McClellan, the prosecutor, that there was missing? Answer, oh, yes, he knew. So the defense is going to say, look, it's not just that you lost these interviews, that I need them, that you don't have them, that they were the critical first week of the investigation. It's not just that. It's also the fact that you didn't even tell us that. You handed over some information without mentioning this big gap. And he says he did tell somebody, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. I'm going to read another section. He says he told the agent of the attorney. So the department is missing also in addition to, and in fact, I'll, let me go ahead and move on down to 63 to four. So question. So in August of 2023, here's what you said about Brad Holder's video that we, we requested you had previously received ISP reports that document those interviews and what was said in those interviews, though we did not locate any videos of those interviews, right? Answer correct. So in other words, what the uh, Richard Allen's lawyer is saying is all you told us was we didn't locate any videos as if, you know, we looked in case we have videoed any of these, we didn't spot any giving the impression that there were never videos. So that's what the defense is saying. You gave us that impression. Question, what you didn't say was that's because they were taped over, did you? You didn't tell us that, did you? Answer, I didn't include that information, no. Question, we did not learn about that, that this tape over business happened until February of 2024, isn't that right? And critically, that is right now, given that trial is mid-May, May 13th, that is shortly before trial is to start. Answer, yes. 
question. Then we asked for any reports that detail the lost recordings, and we just got that in evidence in the last couple of weeks, right? Answer, correct. I must say, I really do appreciate the way the witness just answers. <laughs> Many people don't. They sort of talk around it. The, the witness is just like, yep, that's right. There you have it. So that, but it is significant. It's very significant evidence and information that they're pointing out. So the department is not just missing Brad Holder's interview, and it's not just missing that first week. It's also missing two months worth of interviews from April 28th to June 30th of 2017. Now on those videos, they may have for some of them video, but they don't have audio. So there are times when a video is all important. It may even be the most important thing. Uh, a video may be a body cam or a video of a crime, but it's not true when you're doing an interview. When you're doing an interview, the video without the audio is just not of a lot of use. The whole point of it is the questions that you're asking and the answers. There may be body language, but that's extra. If you don't have the words, you can't really interpret that. So at the hearing, the defense did a good job of pointing out that when law enforcement realized the problem back in 2017, not 2023 or 2024, when it was first revealed to the defense, that back in 2017, they did very, very little to fix the problem. At that point, they were just two to four months after the incident when they learned this in June and end of June. So theoretically, they could have redone the interviews and they would not have been as fresh as they would have been right after the events had happened, but it would be better than say today in 2024. But law enforcement did not do redo, re-over interviews. The chief admitted he also did not send out a memo and warned detectives that data was missing. Say something like, quick, write down everything you remember. So the state police were going to try to use some Chinese software to recover the missing material, but this witness did not know whether anything got recovered, although they do now have some video, even if it doesn't have audio. As for why they didn't tell the defense, he did not have a great reason. He said he did tell someone on the defense team, but he didn't write it down. He told someone who was picking up documents or information, I assume a paralegal, which obviously just saying, you know, I did that, but I didn't write it down. It's not really strong proof that he told the defense. And although the judge seemed to believe that the defense was only concerned about the missing interview of Brad Holder. There may have been other interviews connected to him. Let's head over to page 69. Okay. Um, early on, this is the question, early on there were lots of tips about Brad Holder, right? Answer, there was a few. Question, more than a few, more than a few, would you agree? Answer, a few question and some and so what i understood on direct examination is that when people came in about a tip then they were told some of them at least to go to the delphi police department and get interviewed on video is that right answer yes so some of these people that were if there were people these few tips that were related to brad holder they would have theoretically gone into the interview room as well is that correct answer likely yes and those would be lost. Answer, yes. Question, and because there's no log, you don't know who was interviewed or who was even interviewing, right? Answer, correct. Question, you should have a log. Would you agree? Answer, hindsight's 2020, which <laughs> you can sympathize with him on that, but it is a significant loss. So the defense is right in saying that a summary, there is a summary at least of the Brad Holder interview, there's a summary by an FBI agent. But the defense has a really good point. That's not the same as actually having the interview. Here's, here's how it would work if you try to cross-examine somebody using somebody else's report of it. If you actually have their interview, then they say, I, I think he, I, I never said he did it. And you would, I'm making up things. I never said he did it. And you would pull out the interview. In fact, didn't you say he did it on this date in this interview right here? And he says, no, I never said that. Okay, let's take a look at it together. And you, you said that, right? 
if what it is is somebody's interview and my summary, then you would say to them, isn't it true you said that on such and such a day? And they'd be like, no, he must have just written it down wrong. That isn't what I said at all. There's no great way to fix that. The cross-examination is just not going to be as effective. It's not going to be as good. So let's think, I want to talk about and think through the standard that the judge has to apply to this motion to dismiss. The defense filed this, and let me pull this out and talk to y'all for just a minute because I'm going to have to switch it to another document anyway. So the defense filed this as a motion to dismiss. That means dismiss the entire case, gone. You know, Richard Allen walks out of prison a free man. And I say prison because he actually is in prison, even though he hasn't been convicted yet. And that's another weird story. We'll skip over that for now. All the charges would be gone. No more murder charges against Richard Allen. That's what he was asking for. So that's a huge ask. Very, very rare for an ask that bid to be granted. And nobody on earth thought that Judge Gull in particular was going to grant this request. So, but let's look at what the standard is because it's a, we want to think about this both from what's going to happen on appeal. And also I want to talk a little bit about what maybe the jury will be thinking about. So let me pull up the judge's order and you can take a look at that. And the, okay, here's the judge's order. It's short, so I'm going to read it. It's called, you know, it's a minute order. The court, having had defendant's motion to dismiss for destroying its sculptory, advi sculptory evidence under advisement following a hearing conducted on March 18th, 2024, now denies the motion to dismiss as the defendant has failed to show, and this is really important part, that the evidence was exculpatory, that means made it less likely that he was guilty, more likely that Richard Allen should get off, that he didn't do it, and that it was destroyed, how? Negligently, intentionally, or in bad faith. The recordings of interviews between February 14th to 20th, 2017, and that's all she thought was important, were lost due to human error or were spontaneously lost due to the equipment resetting. At the time the interview of Brad Holder was lost, he was not a key suspect in the case. The interview was memorialized in a written report provided to the defendant. Patrick Westfall was interviewed at his home by FBI agents. That interview was not recorded, but was documented in a written report provided to the defendant. Patrick Westfall was not a key suspect in the case at the time of the interview. As neither Holder nor Westfall were suspects, at the time the interviews were conducted, the defendant has failed to show that the lost interview of Holder was material and that the lack of a recorded interview of Westfall was material. As defendant must establish materiality to claim a denial of due process and Allen has failed to do so, his due process rights have not been violated. So, at so the three things we want to think through are exculpatory, meaning it helps the defense. Let me pull out. Helps the defense, makes it less likely that Richard Allen is guilty and that it was destroyed, that the evidence was destroyed, and then that it was done negligently, intentionally, or in bad faith. I do think everybody seemed to overlook the negligently part. That's not that high a standard. Sure, intentionally or in bad faith, that's a very high standard, but that isn't really the standard here that actually gets applied. So that's sort of the framework. Now let's look specifically at what it was that they were claiming. And I want to dive back into the hearing and look at what the evidence presented was for the motion to defend, to dismiss. This is evidence presented by the defense where they said, we believe that this shows that it would have helped Richard Allen and it was destroyed negligently, intentionally, or in bad faith. So I want to talk before we do about a key player, Todd Click. And you're about to see he was actually there at the hearing. He testified. You're going to see excerpts of what he said. He worked on the case and he wrote the prosecutor. He was a is now a parole agent, but he, at the time he was with the Rushville Police Department. And so I'm going to show you from the Frank's memo that was filed by the defense what it is that we know about him. 
me make sure. All right, looking for the Franks or, oh dear. Oh, I don't think I have it. <laughs> well, hmm, let me pull it up. It won't take me long. Give me just a second. I was just going to read to you and describe who he is, so it isn't critical. If I can't find it, I won't really, really worry about that. So I'm still looking. Give me just a second. Nope, that's not it. There we go. Ta -da! Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go to, I believe it was page 11. So this is, and they, well, maybe it wasn't page 11. Darn it. Let's see what, five to six. Okay, page five. Good thing I write all this down redundantly in lots of different places. Okay, so on May 1st, 2023, the state of Indiana, by way of prosecutor Nick McClellan, received a letter from former Rushville Assistant Police Chief Todd Click. And I'm going to kind of use the highlights only here. He worked on the Delphi murder case. After reading Richard Allen's probable cause affidavit, Click became concerned that the information contained in Richard Allen's affidavit pointing the finger at Richard Allen was far less compelling than the totality of the information that Detective Forensi, Detective Murphy, and Officer Click had accumulated during the Rushville portion of the investigation. This is astonishing. What this is saying is that someone who actually investigated the case wrote the prosecutor and said, what? This is not the guy you should be arresting. Somebody else is who you should be arresting. I've never heard of that. It's astonishing. Click's concerns led him to seek out a lawyer to assist him in the drafting of a letter. Again, unheard of. The letter was not provided to the defense until after it was obvious from the last round of depositions that the defense, who had doggedly pursued witnesses as far away as Georgia, would certainly be talking with Todd Click. So it, it, that's amazing. That's amazing, really, truly amazing information. So let me. Oh, after all that, I wasn't really showing it to you. Well, there it is. Proof that I was reading from pages five and six of the Frank's memo. Okay, so let's talk. So that's one of the key players that I want to talk about. Now, there's another key player that I want to talk about. And this key player is not actually somebody whose interview is missing. And it bothered the judge no end. It really bothered the judge. But let's talk just a little bit, just a minute, about who this guy is. And I'll go ahead and pull that out. So Elvis Fields. Here's what Click says about Elvis Fields. He said he found a photograph with Patrick Westfall and Brad Holder, the two people whose interviews the defense really wants, and a man named Johnny Messer, that they were all together, all wearing Vinlander t-shirts, which is a group that practices Norse and paganism religion along the lines of Odinism. And that he found multiple connections between Elvis Fields and this group. So let's go back into the transcript and take a look at what was said about Elvis Fields. Because the defense confounded the judge and the prosecution by starting off and going heavily into discussion about this guy, Elvis Fields. And we'll talk about why, what the defense was, and what the judge's reaction was. So said, we had spoken with Joyce Moffat, who is Elvis Fields' sister. During that interview, she confirmed that she had heard Elvis make comments about things associated with the crime scene, the murder crime scene of Abby Williams and Liberty German. Okay, question. Okay, what did you do with that information or what did you do next? Answer, the information was given. Of course, myself, Detective Murphy, and Detective Forensi were aware of that information. And I was told by Detective Forensi and Detective Murphy that they were going to try to contact Unified Command to try and obtain a search warrant for the residents of Elvis Fields. Question, okay, what happened with that? Answer, we never heard anything. Question, Unified Command never called and said, yep, tell us what information and we'll try to get that. Answer, yeah, I, Detective Murphy and Detective Forensi were unable to give me an answer as to whether or not we were authorized to get a search warrant. Question, 
So Joyce Moffat, Elvis's sister, says basically he's somehow involved in the crime and you weren't able to secure a search warrant of any type? Answer, that is correct. Question, okay, what happened next? Answer, we conducted several other interviews throughout that time frame. Question, okay, was there any other connection between Elvis Fields and Brad Holder that you know of? Answer, we were able to connect Elvis Fields to a gentleman by the name of Josh Chrisman. And he goes on to talk a little bit about a connection there, which I think we won't get into that. There were, but we'll move on to this one. There were some pictures on Elvis Fields' Facebook page and Brad Holder's Facebook page that were very similar in nature. Question, what do you mean by that? Answer, there was pictures of sticks that were placed in different arrangements. I know that there was a like a picture of a folding pocket knife that they each had. They each had similar pictures of trees. It was just the similarities were very odd. So this is extremely important information, but now the prosecutor is going to make a very reasonable, very good objection. The prosecutor is going to say, judge, I'm going to object. Their motion is about a missing audio recording of a Brad Holder interview, and I'm not sure what the connection with Elvis Fields or how this is helpful to us with regard to their motion. Excellent point, excellent point. And the judge said, how is this relevant to your motion? And here is the defense's response. Judge, Mr. McClellan, in his response to our motion, said that two things, and I'll, number one, that the, it's this, the missing document, the missing video is not either exculpatory or materially useful to the defense. What I'm doing right now is laying the foundation at the end of the road, you will see that, yeah, this is actually, it actually would be materially useful to the defense based upon his investigation. Number one. Number two, you'll be finding a moment in finding in a moment that, well, Mr. McClellan argued bad faith. You, the defense means the, de the defense has to prove bad faith. Well, that's difficult to do. And part of what is happening here is you're going to learn that Mr. Click, that the law enforcement working on this case operated in bad faith in that they refused to investigate. They tried to. And so and then the court cuts him off about them. So the prosecutor is saying, why are we talking about Elvis Fields? What does this have to do with anything? This, this is not about the right people. And the defense has a good answer. The defense is saying, remember, Judge, one of the things we have to show you is that this is not is that this would be helpful to Richard Allen, that it would matter, that it would improve his situation, and that it was destroyed negligently, intentionally, or in bad faith. So the defense is saying, Look at the fact, Judge, that they didn't investigate this guy, Elvis Fields, and he was connected to these people whose interviews are missing. That that means that this was intentional. It was in bad faith. And it means that it's material because it connects right up to what we need to prove in order to show that our client, Richard Allen, is not the person who did this. So, and the defense goes on to talk yet more about what it is that they believe makes Elvis Fields really guilty. This drives the judge nuts. So here's what they say, but it's some important information that they're actually getting in testimony form. There was back in, this is the answer, there was back in February of 2018, I believe Jerry Holman and Kevin Murphy interviewed Elvis Fields at the Rushville Police Department and when Detective Murphy took Elvis back to his trailer, Elvis approached Detective Murphy and said, hey, if my spit is found on those girls and I've got a reason for why it's there, I'll be okay, correct? Question, okay, after that type of information, do you know if that was relayed, was that part of what information, if you know, was relayed to the unified command here to try to see if they'd be willing to get a search warrant for Elvis Fields' house? Answer, yes. And that was, if I recall, that was part of the, well, there were some statements that Elvis had made to his sister that initially prompted the investigation into Elvis Fields. Question, okay, and was that Joyce Moffat or somebody else? Answer, that was a different sister. Question, okay, what did that part of your investigation reveal? Answer, Elvis had made some statements to his sister Mary Abrams, I don't recall exactly all of the words that he used, but he had told Mary that he was going to go away for a while. He had done something bad to some girls. 
He was on a high bridge that they had placed sticks in one of the girl's hair to represent antlers that he had. He was in a gang gang, and that he had a brother now. Extremely damaging, potentially, testimony, right? If this came in at trial, then this is really, really important because it suggests that there's someone else confessing to the crime, confessing to the crime of murdering the two girls. And so they would, the defense obviously wants to prove that. For this purpose, they don't have to prove that. that this isn't something they're actually proving. All they're doing right now is showing that this is material, that it would have helped Richard Allen and that it was destroyed negligently, intentionally, or in bad faith. So they're saying all of this connects up and that's why this is important. Now, the prosecution says, well, this is that this information, like, for example, the letter that I got from Click, the McClellan got from Click, that doesn't prove bad faith back in 2017. That was years ago. The defense says this shows everything is all connected. Everybody is in cahoots. There was no real investigation. They just pinned it on Richard Allen without real good reason. And Click says also that the prosecution promised to sit down. I'm going to go ahead and pull out so I can talk to you all a little more. So since the prosecution promised to sit down with him and explain why they arrested Richard Allen so that they could try and, quote, put my mind at ease, he said, but that they never sat down with him. They never explained it. He said he felt law enforcement needed to get Johnny Messer's cell phone and he contacted them to remind them of that, but they never did. And he finally contacted the defense team and they finally went and got it. Not the prosecution, but the defense time team. So let me go over here. And I, there's a number of people <laughs> that I have been skipping uh, and not thanking. Amanda the thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm glad you're enjoying the coverage. I find this case absolutely fascinating. Really, really fascinating. And Jersey Jen, oh, thank you. She says, show your love for Miss Lee and her hardworking mods. Definitely, please show your love for the mods. They are amazing. I'm so grateful to Marlon and to Mama Pinks for the work they do for us, keeping the chat nice and pleasant and happy. And it's such a relief because the people who watch my, my videos just are a different crew. They are people who really want to know the truth. They really want some facts. They have very intelligent, high-level discussion, but they also are people who respect each other and are really accepting and understanding that someone may have a different opinion. And I've just been so impressed and pleased and grateful that Marlon and Mama Pinks have helped us maintain that. So law enforcement, the prosecutor pointed out, and the judge as well, re-interviewed Brad Holder in 2023. The defense says that's not good enough. You can't just make up for something by re-interviewing someone six years later. And that is true. Once memories fade, you can't just magically recreate them. You can't bring those back. And part of the point is to catch people contradicting what they said before, changing their stories. If you can find that, you think about what the prosecution did with Michelle Traconis. That's something really critical if you can see somebody who has different things that they've said. So without that first interview to compare the 2023 one to, it's really not possible to cross-examine Brad Holder on the ways in which his story may have changed. So the defense also says Brad told his ex he had a falling out with Patrick Westfall because of, quote, a ritual gone bad in a forest by the river. So you cannot make up for evidence like that. If it's missing, you can't cross-examine very effectively from a report that someone else did. So the judge, however, got more and more impatient with them for putting on this evidence that was related to whether or not there was a proper investigation. So now I want to talk about, and on the, I'll say this on the interview of Patrick Westfall, I think the ruling as to that makes sense. What the prosecution said was, look, this guy was interviewed at his house. He wasn't even interviewed in the place where the there were videotapes that were overwritten. We didn't have any duty to video it. We didn't. And that was the only testimony that came in at the hearing. So they're saying that isn't really all that significant. We, there wasn't even a video that we should have had in the first place. 
The missing video interview of Brad Holder, though, is much more problematic. There's a memo, basically notes that the FBI agent took, but it's not the same and it won't be the same. What bothers me the most, I think, is that law enforcement can't say what exactly they don't have. They don't even know who was interviewed or what they've lost. In a murder investigation, when this man is potentially going to be sent away forever, that seems really important, a significant oversight to me. So as I mentioned earlier, one thing nobody mentioned is that it, the judge's order seems to say that it would be enough if law enforcement was negligent and certainly failing to flip the light or flip the switch on and off to, to stop it from over recording. That does seem like it, that the defense would have an argument that there was negligence here. So I'm going to answer a couple of another, um, a couple, another, <laughs> a couple more questions. Um, uh, well, let me, let me head over here. <laughs> I'm being incoherent now. Oh, peeps. Welcome. We have a new member. Glad to have you peeps. I'm glad you are a new member. And Glenda Kildow has been a member for a month. Glad for that. Welcome Glenda for the full month now. And armchair apothecary says, Tada, oh, how we love you. That's funny. Yes. Well, what can I say? I, I did manage to get the, the document up for you. So, uh, so I'm, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Armchair Apothecary. So I want to talk about why it is that I think that this is a potential time bomb for the prosecution. On appeal, it's going to be a significant issue. It's going to be discussed. I think it's going to be hard for the, the appellate court to say that this is a reason that the case should have been dismissed for the same reason it was hard for the trial court, maybe maybe slightly differently. I think the trial court would have ruled against it anyway, but you have to think about the fact that remember what the, what the witness said. He said, this wasn't just this case and we lost a few interviews or who knows how many interviews from this case. It was other cases as well. It was anybody who was interviewed in this room and the DVR was overriding. We could have lost other people's interviews as well. If the if the judge weighed in and said, okay, I'm going to consider this to be something that I'm not going to, I'm going to grant this motion to dismiss, who knows how many other cases might then be open to be dismissed as well, because those other people also may be missing interviews. So it, and granted, there would have to be proof that it was something that was significant, but one of the biggest problems with this is it's literally impossible to prove that it was significant since they kept no logs and they have no record of that. And to me, that means that even I, I, if I were the appellate court, I would say, look, if you're missing evidence and you can't even tell us what it is, then I think we should presume that it was exculpatory. I'll zip past that. And now I'm going to look at the next two points. And so I, who knows what the appellate court will do, but for the same reason, it's going to be hard for them to say, this is going to um, go across different cases. They have to be really careful about that because they don't want to open up a can of worms where a bunch of people suddenly no longer are convicted or no longer have sound valid convictions because of this interview. It's really going to be hard for them to make that ruling. So uh, that's why I think on appeal, it will be a significant issue. I don't know that the appellate court is going to reverse on this ground either. But, and here's my third reason, at a minimum, it makes law enforcement look inept. It gives the defense a whole lot to talk about. I really do think there probably should be some instructions that, you know, the following evidence is missing. You may presume that it was negative to the prosecution. That's what would happen in a civil case. There would be an instruction based on spoliation. It's called it spelled spoli spoliation. It basically means spoiled evidence, but it's not spelled that way. It comes from the Latin. So the, but it's spoliation of evidence. And typically one of the remedies is you, you don't get to take advantage of the fact that evidence is destroyed on your watch. As a result, if evidence is destroyed, it's going to go against you. We're going to tell the jury to presume it's against you. So I don't know what the appellate courts will do here, but even if they do nothing, I think that the defense has a really big argument that, hey, this was really inept. This 
entire investigation was poorly done in this entire investigation should have looked at a bunch of avenues other than waiting six years and arresting Richard Allen for no more information than what they had before. So I think that sets up the defense argument. Will the jury buy it? It would. It's always unusual when a defendant gets acquitted in one of these cases, but it gives them a lot more to talk about than normal. So that's why I think it's so critically important and interesting. Okay, so I have a couple more people. Like, go ahead and be putting your questions in. And, oh, that's wonderful. Jennifer Jansen just gifted 20 lawyerly memberships. One of Thank you so much. And one of the great things we've been doing with the memberships, Marlon, our moderator, made special emojis for us that we get to use. And I asked y'all, I, I hope I didn't <laughs> show this earlier. I asked y'all earlier, let me share my screen uh, on Friday. I said, show me you as, let me pull that down. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> I said, show me you as one of our emojis. Did Sandra M nail it or what? Isn't this great? So the emoji, the shocked emoji, you can see that on the right. On the left, um, our subscriber, Sandra M, doing her impression of the shot emoji. So send me your impressions of you as one of the emojis, costume, how you look, whatever. Uh, I would love to see those. I think this is, Sandra just absolutely nailed this. Way to go, Sandra. So I loved that. And they're a lot of fun because it's just sort of a unique way you can comment. A lot of times we even do polls and things like that with it. It's just been an absolute great time. So I'm headed over. And I'm going to, well, let me go ahead and see if there are any questions. I'm looking back through because I didn't get over fast enough. Let's see, seven, four, yeah. Okay. So I'm looking for question marks. Oh, forgot to say question marks at the beginning. Hopefully everybody knew that. Okay, Drew P., what happens to an investigation when an arrest is made five years after the crime? Well, it, as far as... Drew, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me. It, what happens to the investigation, I would say, is no different. It's just more of it. There's just five years worth instead of the shorter amount of time. So the investigation will still be the basis for the prosecution. It's just took them a while. When you think about it, the uh, Adelson trial took absolutely forever before it got to trial. And now Donna Adelson's trial is still to come. She was arrested after her son, Charlie, years after Dan Markell was killed. Annie Kay, how will it ever be proven either way that the loss of information or evidence seems to implicate some potentially involved law enforcement officers? Annie, exactly the problem. You've got your finger on it, which is you can't prove it. If the evidence is literally missing, you cannot prove that. And that is just really frustrating. For everybody, it can definitely hurt the prosecution if these interviews would have been useful for them, and it can hurt the defense if he ends up missing exculpatory evidence that would have been useful for him. Veronica, how will religion play in this case? Interesting question, since that was part, part of what they were practicing, according to the defense theory, this Nordic religion. And of course, we see similar issues in the Daybell case. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But we see those similar issues in the Daybell case where there are religious issues around the case and around the crime. As far as how it will play in in this case, I think only to the extent they'll probably ask jurors and qualified jurors to make sure they're not members of this same religion, if possible, or they'll ask the judge to exclude them if they are. But I think they'll also talk about why it is the defense will. They think that this religious orientation played into the crime. They believe that there are actually symbols they left that show why they did this. And even the way perhaps the girls were murdered relates to the particular religion and what they were practicing. So I think that's how it'll work out. Todd Moore is intrigued by the ritual situation or cult. How many can be involved? Can you talk about that? I, honestly, we, we don't know, right? And the defense would say it could be all of these people. There were five people mentioned by click in that photograph. Were they all involved? We have no way of knowing that, of course. But could it have been a 
a, lots of tentacles, lots of people. Yeah, possible. But we don't have enough information to answer that. I don't know that the defense has enough information to answer that, but they don't have to. All they have to do really is, is show reasonable doubt. So if they can cast enough questions or they can show enough doubt, cast enough doubt around whether other people could have been involved, could have done it. That's all they have to do or want to do. Okay. Looking, uh, Kelt, will the jury get to hear about this missing information? I, I surely they will. I, I cannot imagine that that would not be something that is allowed in evidence because it is entirely relevant that there, there was an interview and it's not available. I, I, personally think it should be allowed in. I can't say for sure how the ruling will go here. And maybe there's some particular novel area of Indiana law. I don't know. I don't practice there, but for certainly it would surprise me if this wasn't included. I think it ought to be. Conservative what? Miss Construe asked me. I'm not sure if that was a question for me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, Miss Construe. I can't answer that one. All right, looking quick for questions. I may have answered them all. Let me go ahead while I'm going to click through. Oh, I need to thank Atticus. Thank you. I really appreciate that super sticker. Thank you very much. So I'm going to, as I'm looking through for any more question marks, I want to talk just a little bit about what it is that we uh, are going to be covering starting tomorrow. We're going to do an extra live stream tomorrow night. What I, We are going to be covering Chad Daybell's trial Assuming the Karen Reed trial starts in the middle of May, I plan to alternate with covering the Karen Reed trial as well. But we're going to be starting with Chad Daybell. The jury has been selected. There are 12 jurors, six alternates. They won't know who's who for a while, but they are all in place, ready to go. But the judge has given everybody the day off tomorrow to prepare. And on Wednesday will be opening statements. So tomorrow, what we're going to look at is we're going to look back at the opening statements, not watch the whole thing, but excerpts of the hope, opening statements from the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. And we're going to use that to kind of get ready, understand the facts, the situation. And one of the things I want to do as soon as we have Chad's opening statement, I want to compare them because I think they're going to be really different. I think that the opening statement made by Lori Vallow Daybell's attorney is going to vastly contrast with what Chad Daybell says, what his attorneys say. So I think that is going to show us a direction of where the whole defense will go and how and whether this trial is going to be really different. Will it be different result? That's a different issue. But will it be different in terms of the way it's tried? I think absolutely it sure will. Amber uh, Cumpian says, isn't almost everyone interviewed in the beginning considered a person of interest, especially when the family is saying to look into this person? How could they not be? <laughs> that would be the defense view. And actually, it's my view as well. I, I can't imagine that if the family is saying look into this person, that it wouldn't be of extreme importance and is even saying that he confessed or a roundabout way confessed. I, I see that as extremely important. I do think that absolutely would have been important. And there are reasons why they pulled Brad Holder in first too. There, there's, there are reasons why he was there. Now, in the end, they decided that they had its alibis and they decided that they weren't directly involved, but that doesn't mean that other people within that circle weren't involved. And so I think that that's probably what's going to be the next decision. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody. Uh, don't forget tomorrow bonus live stream at 7 PM. We're going to get ready for the Chad Daybell trial. I want to thank Marlon and Mama Pinks for um, moderating for us tonight. Thank you so much for your help, both of you. And I will see you all tomorrow at 7 p.m. Prosecution showed it to jury, and so you can get a pretty good look at it, too. Red blood-like substance on it. He said it was even wet and leaking everywhere. That was a quote. Zip ties. A razor blade. Why were these items there? in the back window is a bobblehead of Alec Murdoch going back and forth.